Hello, I'm Afsane Beshlas, founder and CEO of Rock Creek. Today, I'm so happy to welcome two of our senior advisory members and a world-renowned investor, Britt Harris. Um, Dr. Greenspan serves on our advisory board and was Federal Reserve Chairman for 19 years. Um, Dr. Laura Tyson serves on our advisory board as well, and she's professor at the Haas School of Business, UC Berkeley. We are very fortunate to be joined today by uh, Mr. Britt Harris, who must be the only person that has been um, the chief investment officer for a Fortune 100 company. Uh, one of the biggest public pension plans uh, in the world, Texas Retirement Plan, as well as uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, university endowment in the country, UTIMCO. And I've known Britt since the 1990s. Britt has been um, one of the most important people in our lives because he taught us about how to become really better parents, particularly in the sports world, as our kids started playing football and baseball. And he shared his book. That's right. It's invaluable. How to Absolutely. teach a little, little league pitcher. I Absolutely. traded that with Michael for his presidential books. So thank you for, to all of you for being um, uh, here today. I think we all heard the Federal Reserve recently in its annual report uh, underscored the growing threat to asset values, to credit markets, and the intense stress that the COVID-19 has placed on the financial markets, but also even before we started with this pandemic, we had huge income inequality in the country. And um, now with, um, with COVID-19 and the impact of it, we have several crises going on. So I was curious to hear from all of you how you see this and uh, what is your reaction to the report? You give me the virus number. I'll give you the GDP that's implicit in it. The vast proportion of uncertainty is fundamentally in that particular area. Mm -hmm. As yeah. a number, if we knew uh, uh, all the uncertainties that are caused by the virus, we have the makings of uh, uh, pretty much all the critical aspects which go into the GDP. When people say to me, you know, let's look at the forecast, now we'll go to the issue of the uh, uh, virus later. And so you've got it exactly right, 180 <laughs> degrees in the wrong direction. So if you remember, we started the year out with GDP expected to grow at, I think, 1.7. Inflation was going to be about the same, and employment was 3.5, and everything was fine. And then we, you know, we rode into February. And all of a sudden, I wrote a paper called, you know, Three Rogue Waves. A rogue wave is just something that just comes out of the ocean. It's not a tidal wave that you see coming from far away. There's no way to prepare for it. And one of the rogue waves, of course, was the virus. The second one was the uh, oil situation. And the third one, which we've kind of forgotten about now, was that that was a period of time when, when uh, Bernie Sanders got in the lead. And I'm not, I'm not making that as a political statement, but just people had just said that if that happens, the market would probably suffer. And it was... All this stuff was in the, like the same, in a 10 day period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the, the, the question is like, the, the thing that's happened here is one, we had, had two at the same time. And we had an attack on our country in terms of our health system. We had an attack on our energy complex, you know, all at the same time. The dip, big difference here, though, is not that we had a virus, this, in my opinion. The big difference we have now is how we've reacted to the virus. It appears that we're financing this uh, as if it's a war. And in a war, uh, you know, it's a threat to your survival. And so it's, you know, do whatever it takes, you know, uh, spend whatever it takes for as long as it takes. And don't worry about the future because you're, you're, the whole point is we just got, there is no future if we don't get past this. And you have to create the, the assets in which to finance the war. So in World War II, we created the assets the same way we're doing now through the fiscal policy and monetary policy. and and uh, we went out and bought tanks and we bought ships and we bought soldiers and we bought supplies. You know, this time the enemy is not over. This is a big deal, by the way. This is, the enemy is not over there. It's, this is not a situation where we sent our troops overseas and we all stayed here and prayed for them and supported them and cranked up the, cranked up the, uh, the economy for them and waited for them to come home. No, this is, a, this, this is a, an enemy that we brought to the, to the front porch of every, every house in America. And so every single person here is not supporting the war. They're in the war. And that's a, that's a national psyche situation. The, and so instead of, we create the money, 
This is the most modern implementation of monetary and fiscal policy ever. Um, obviously, these things have occurred and they, people learn over time. Um, Laura also has written recently about um, sort of how innovation is a good thing, but how it's also impacting things. I was one of the people who had been worrying and doing some research on longer term trends in automation and what and its effect on jobs and uh, now automation slash digitization. Um, and what we what we kind of know from the United States and from the rest of the world as well, the, the rest of the advanced industrial countries is that the uh, routine middle skill, middle task level, and the routine cognitive or routine manual jobs, those are the ones that get taken out over time. The good news is that, that uh, if, you know, when you look back at history, the greatest innovations uh, tend to occur during times of crisis. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. So I, I heard a quote that I virtually think is great about World War II, it said they rode in on horses and they flew out splitting the atom. That's great. Rode in on horses, they flew out splitting the atom. We'll do the same. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly how it'll work, but we'll do the same. Mm -hmm. the, but as Lars you know, was talking about, we were, we're in the second machine age. And you know, so this machine age is replacing uh, uh, mental labor as opposed to physical labor. Mm -hmm. And that's sweeping out all over the world. And that's one of the main drivers of income inequality. I think it was a very interesting fact which we have not fully explained of the critical advanced technologies which now exist. They all originated in the United States. It's, uh, you, you look at the structure and uh, where is the rest of the world on this? They all seek, I mean, I'm exaggerating only slightly. And I think it's a fascinating issue as to, I mean, well, uh, well, think of all the high, the really very productive, uh, advanced technology-oriented companies. Where are they? They're sitting right. There. That's right. That's right. I, I, but I, then I have a question for both of you because I, I certainly agree with that. That's what the facts are. Um, much of that funding, the basic science and the base and the training of the talent that was the innovative driver here, came uh, through two major channels of the United States. I remember it. Uh, one is uh, defense and two is health. Because people used to say when I was in government that the way you could get science funded and technical training funded was either it was to save your grandmother, that's the health, <laughs> or it was for war. So the science base was here. Somebody else once said to me, we put the science base here, we, did, we put the tax base in the Cayman Islands, <laughs> production base in China. Okay, yes. we basically moved it all around. And now we, we, there's increasing concern. No, we've got to bring some of this technology base back to the United States because it's national security. I, I wonder how you feel about this innovative national security link here. You know, all the things that, that you described, Laura, as you know, well know, is that's all, those are all the results of globalization. So we've been in globalization for quite a long time and that, right. you know, optimization, just in time, right. low cost production, all that. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, and so now what you're going to see is a deglobalization and you're going to see a, a just, you know, on a, on a micro level, you're going to also, we've been urbanizing, you're going to see a de-urbanization. So it's almost like we're going to play the, play the movie backwards for a little while. And the, the key term now that everybody's going to be talking about is, is not just in time or maximum productivity or anything like that. They're going to be talking about resilience. Right, right. And resilience is going to be the new, mm -hmm. um, the new most important factor. Great. Uh, if you look at whether it is the U.S. or whether it is China or it's actually all emerging markets or Europe, it's the it's been the era the last ten years of the mega companies, right? And uh, mega companies mainly in tech or consumer related that are related to tech. So you talked about the plight of small businesses. Post-COVID, isn't it going to be even worse? Because the big companies have the resources, the small companies are going to die. Yeah. Um, are we, 
going to be in a worse world on that side, which cannot do what you were talking about in terms of de-urbanization or deglobalization or... So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the large point about concentration is, is um, people do not realize how, how, how much people think they're concentrated in many industries all over the world. Just as a small example, you know, the largest five companies uh, in the S&P 500 now, as a, as a percent of S&P 500, they're the, they're the largest that we've ever had. I mean, these are these companies are unbelievably concentrated, right. and there's uh, and they're powerful and they're, and they're you know they're doing great things. But I'll tell you, they're they're huge, and they're and they're. I'm not saying they should be heavily regulated, but you know what country are they really in? I mean, they're I mean, they're located here, but right. you know they've got equal amount of business all over the world. Right. So, and just in the as a small example, the because you know we're down here in Texas, and you know might have noticed we've had you know. A, kind of a shock down here. We've been giving oil away for a little while. We never thought we'd do that. But um, what's going to, you know, what we believe is unfortunately going to happen here is, you know, we've got so many independent um, um, producers down here, and they've, you know, they, you know, they produce a lot of our, our energy, and they've worked hard. And, and under these circumstances, a lot of them are going to really struggle. And and it just seems like the the uh, powers that be, you know, it basically said, you know, we're just going to allow the, the small company in this industry just to kind of go quietly into the night mm -hmm. because they know that the bigger companies can come in, they can replace the production and, you know, and that's, and so they're not worried about the production there. And, and all of a sudden you're going to have a much more concentrated energy complex and, and don't, don't, uh, don't miss the fact that in this last go round with Saudi Arabia and OPEC and Russia and so on, uh, you know, they, they had, a, they had a demand, you know, they, they, de they demanded that we cut our production as well. Mm -hmm. And you know who our is in America? You're talking about energy. It's Texas. It's Texas. So, well, it's Texas. well, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's not that. Yes. Yeah, Texas. Yeah. yeah. So, and of course, we're private. Independent suppliers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and so don't be surprised. I'm going to say a little bit of a provocative thing here, but don't be surprised if in, you know, 10 or so years, there's, you know, we ourselves are not some uh, uh, associated with OPEC in some way. No, nobody, nobody has mentioned shale. Yes. Shale is one of the major American inventions. Yes, it is. Absolutely extraordinary. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it's hard to see how uh, it could have arisen anywhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. the, when you look around the world now, uh, we have become the largest producer of crude oil. Why? For the shale oil. We were fading away. Uh, fairly rapidly several decades ago, and then all of a sudden, this marvelous invention, which took years to work their way through, uh, it produced a uh, uh, country which moved ahead of Saudi Arabia and Russia as major crude oil producers in the world. That's right. You know that that I uh, just have to mention since you mentioned that that's a Texas A&M graduate who came up with that. <laughs> yes, know. of course. You, so, have, you yeah. have to say that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, on that happy note, I wanted to thank every one of you. This has been a great conversation. I hope we continue having these conversations about uh, other topics that will be coming up. Hopefully, you're right in the sense that uh, we will be coming out of this sooner than later. Uh, I am with uh, Brit in the sense that I think coming out of it, it will take us a little bit longer than most people think to come out and, you know, growth might be a little slower, but hopefully everything you've talked about today, the innovations that our economy in the U.S. has been so famous about, will take us out of this and take us to a stronger place. So thank you for making the time and really, really hugely appreciate you taking the time today. Thank, thank you. you for having us.